Hello and welcome to News Click. The origins of human civilization in the Indian continent have long been a subject of intense political and ideological debate. On the one hand, we have the right wing in India, which has often spread the version that human civilization itself originated in the subcontinent. But archaeological evidence and a whole lot of scientific research has actually proved that India is no exception. And the same patterns of migration which characterize human settlement across the world extend to India too. In recent times, there has been a lot of research that has been done on this issue. And to talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Purkais. Thank you, Prabir, for joining us. Prabir, so two new papers have appeared in the Cell and Science magazines recently, journals recently. So could you talk a bit about what exactly these uh, papers say and what is the background for them? Well, the earlier papers, the Vagish, Narasimhan, uh, Reich paper, that had been available as a preprint. So we already know the contours of that has been well discussed earlier, which had talked about a large number of skeletons and the uh, being able to recover ancient DNA from them. And therefore, it looked at two migrations that have taken place in relatively recent times, say about 10,000 years before now, and uh, about, say, 3,000 years, 2,000 to, you know, 2000 years before uh, current epoch, yeah. so maybe about 4000 years before yeah. now. So these two papers talked about the migration of the agriculturalists and the uh, other one talked about the migration of the what's called the steppes population associated with the horse cultures and carrying the Indo-European languages So because it's a very large language group. So these were the two papers that, uh, the, the, this was the two major migrations it talked about earlier. One of the issues that was still not settled was if you look at the Harappan culture, the Harappan civilization or the Indus Valley civilization as it is also called, then the question is who were the founders of this uh, civilization. There has been an argument this was totally indigenous, there has been an argument that it was the Iranian agriculturalists from uh, Zagros mountains who came and spread agriculture. And there is also the issue that uh, did it predate the invasion of the steppes population, otherwise what is being called the Aryan invasion right. theory and so on. And that the word itself is a very old one. We are really talking of the steppes population who carried the Indo-European language groups. So this, this is the uh, issue that was left unsettled because the skeletons from Rakigari, the one Harappan site which was available, these were very difficult at that point of time to analyze because they really have ancient DNA which have degenerated quite a bit because of the hot climate that is there in India. But the earlier paper which has now been printed in science, uh, that has very clear evidence that you have what is called a population in which you have the ancient uh, South Asian hunter-gatherer population. Then you have a second set of uh, genetic markers which would seem to indicate associated with the Harappan people, origin still not clear. And then there is the steppes population which signature comes around 15 years, uh, 1500 years before uh, current epoch, so about 3000 to 3500 years before. So this was the status. Now even there, there were very interesting uh, issues that were found. It were found, for instance, the steppes population signature is not there in the Harappan uh, population. Uh, if we take this, uh, the, the kind of markers that we are talking about, it was not shown conclusively. Why? Because the Rakigari uh, DNA had still not been analyzed. After a lot of effort, they have successfully analyzed one women's DNA. DNA. Now that of course is only a sample size of one. So how much conclusion should be drawn on that is not clear. But it is substantiates what was shown earlier that if you take Rakigari as one spot and you take the two other areas which were at that point of time looked at where there are 11 more skeletons. One is in Golur and the other one was in Shore, Shore Sokta. Shore Shokta, I may get the pronunciation of the Persian wrong. That was the other place where they found skeletons. So we get about 11 skeletons, genetic evidence from that, which seem to show their outliers. They are not really a part of the Iranian uh, uh, agriculturalists. And they seem to have, therefore, could have had be 
people who had come as migrants from the Harappan, uh, right. shall we say, centers or uh, urban uh, cities and so on. So that is now conclusively shown that these 11 skeletons, the genetic evidence and the genetic evidence of Rakhigari show a close match. So this seems to be people of Harappan, uh, in Harappa, uh, they, as you know, there are a large number of urban settlements that were there. They did travel to these places and some of them were there as migrants. But the Rakhigari sample does not show that there is any step signature on that. So the step signature that we find in today's population obviously came later. And that matches very well what we know happened in Eastern Europe and the Central Asian steppes. So that part of it, I think the, the, the conclusive evidence of course, would be if we find more skeletons, yes. but it does seem to show that it bears or it's consistent with the picture that we are getting. Mm -hmm. The important part of the Rakhigari genetic signature, I think, lies in the fact that it showed that it deviates. All this 11 plus 1 that we now are talking about shows the deviation from the Iranian, not the agriculturalists, but Iranian hunting gathering, had hunting hunter gatherers about 12,000 years before current epoch, which would, sorry, 12,000 years before now, right. which would seem to show that agriculture developed after the split. Mm -hmm. Now, the question that still remains that the, why did the same group of hunter gatherers develop agriculture both in Harappa, uh, the Harappan, uh, sorry, the Indus Valley, as well as in Zagros Mountains and so on. And it would seem to sh indicate that there was proto-agriculture across what is now called the Fertile Crescent. And there was some amount of, shall we say, uh, taming of the crops, shall we say, which takes place because of the climatic change that has taken place has become warmer. And there is now the possibility of growing uh, food crops. So, looking at taming the grasses, which is what then becomes your cereals and lentils and so on. So if we look at all of that, it seems that the proto-agriculture developing earlier, which gets carried over from the Iranian hunter-gatherers, but the proper development of agriculture, which you see from Mehergar onwards, is really indigenous to the Harappan uh, civilization. So we have these two centers which were there. Both grew, developed agriculture, had some original links, but both the, shall we say, the development of agriculture in Iran, in uh, Mesopotamia and in Harappan uh, civilization takes place at roughly similar times. Probably the Mesopotamian Iran is maybe a little earlier, maybe the Harappan was a little 500 years, 1000 years later, but the scale that we are talking of, it really does not matter. Right. The Harappan civilization or the Indus Valley civilization definitely had agriculture and the steppes migration that we see takes place later. In any case, it's futile to talk about migrations taking place from South Asia because honestly speaking, we are all out of Africa and therefore the major history of humankind is really Africa and the population that we talk about 60, 65, 70,000 years back that settles most of India is really population which came out from that and the majority of the genetic signatures we carry are from that stock. So we are really talking first. of the what would be called the first Indians. So what we are really talking about is later shall we say migrations that have shaped certain elements of what we see today. But the basic substrate of all Indians is really the South Asian hunter-gatherer, which came about 65, 70,000 years back. So one of the authors of the paper has said that uh, this basically conclusively disproves what is called the Aryan invasion theory. You mentioned it also. So could you talk a bit about uh, the theory itself and whether that claim is correct? And also what is the, uh, say, ideological implication? You know, Shinde seems to be referring to uh, Mortimer Wheeler. That's what he seems to have mentioned. And that's pre-47, and that's a long, long time ago. There is a conjecture that why did the Indus Valley civilization fall? And a number of historians had made the conjecture that it fell due to Aryan invasion. But it has already been shown fairly conclusively based on archaeological evidence that the Mohenjo-daro Harappa 
cities, the urban cities fall before you can see the influx of the uh, steppes population or in this case in the European right. language speakers. And this is clearly there that the urban centers have fallen and there is no, there is no history of large scale violence we can see. So therefore, it seems to have been much more due to climatic reasons. The fact that there was a dry spell and because they were based on a thin surplus, so therefore the civil urban centers could not continue, though the agriculture and other uh, civil part of the civilization still continues. The Indo-European language speakers who came seems to have come uh, and imposed their language on a large population, large numbers of people, not only here but in various other places. That is why in Eurasia, it's still if you leave the Chinese Southeast Asian part of it out, it is still the largest language group that, that is there. Yes. Now, this language group the obviously has, I, has to be from some place. It is futile to talk about the birthplace having superiority because nobody ascribes the superiority to the Yamana pastoralists who are the ones who supposedly were the, origi the original carriers of the Indo-European languages. Right. Neither Europe nor South Asia needs therefore to talk about who is superior because the language is what changed 4000 years back. So I think this is a completely futile uh, shall we say debate. And what is shown very clearly is the steppes population signature is there across a very large region. There is a dominance of the Indo-European languages. So they seem to have come and because they were mobile, they had horses and therefore they were able to impose themselves as a kind of ruling elite over a large number of societies and it is a language that therefore has did spread. Right. And it also shows that if you take the Indian genetic uh, history now into account that there are really three broad shall we say uh, migrations that we can talk about, about if we leave the eastern Indian part out which is the ancient uh, hunter gatherers, the original first Indians as Tony Joseph calls it. The second is the uh, Iranian hunter gatherers who take to agriculture the expansion of that we see in Indus Valley, number of people that go up and therefore it spread both south as well as towards the east. Right. And then you have the steppe signature which comes in later. Right. These are the three migrations that have taken place and the Indian population is a mixture of these three migrations with the dominant component still being the original out of Africa migration that takes place and which is the original shall we say the ancient substrate on which everything else exists. And finally considering uh, the recent archaeogenetical discoveries and how do you actually place them in, in the context of archaeology and say other kinds of evidence and where do you see this going from? You see earlier we had linguistic evidence but the problem about historical linguistics is that you do not have ancient texts, you only have text after literacies there. And since we have not deciphered the, uh, the Harappan uh, shall we say tablets, the Harappan sorry seals, since we have not deciphered the Harappan seals, therefore we really do not know what the Harappans wrote and what their language was. So without that you have only for a long period you would have had oral history. And you can trace languages in their proximity but only approximately, you do not really know at what rate languages change, which way it changed and so on. So that historical linguistics looking at how languages change and when it is there in textual form has to be matched with the archaeological record. And both of these have consistently shown the figures that we are talking about. When did the steppes population come into India, the Indo-European speakers come, when was the Harappan civilization there, all of this, these fig, fig fact, the dates that we are talking about. They are really from both archaeological sources as well as historical linguistics. And it is interesting that the genetic evidence really uh, does uh, complement that. And you are seeing independent verification therefore. Already archaeological evidence, historical linguistics are relatively independent of each other. To that if you add the genetic evidence that is also independent, then you see from broad three angles you are really seeing the same picture and that is a very strong confirmation therefore 
of that these broad streams that we've talked about, broad, broad migrations and broad dates are now verified by three independent sources. As you know, if independently in science you verify something, then that is a much stronger verification than a single particular analysis and a single data set providing that answer. So I think we are pretty much on same grounds to look at how the basic migration patterns are. But yes, we have only seen one data point in Rakigari for the Harappan civilization. And we need to see whether we can get more such data points, more such archaeogenetic material. And this has been a major exercise of trying to recover genetic evidence from one sample. How much can we repeat it elsewhere? And whether we should therefore be able to develop a more coherent history based on archaeogenetic evidence as well. And I think that is something that we need to wait for. But yes, I think a major, major step forward if we could recover the archaeogenetic evidence from the Rakigari skeletons. Hopefully, others which are later would be easier to do. Thank you, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.